So welcome to this second episode of our conversations with Dr. Shilpa McQuillan, who is a community gynaecologist and menopause spe- specialist. She's actually been a hospital gynaecologist too. Um, if you've missed the first episode, strongly recommend that you go back and watch that one, which was all about menopause myth busting. And that has gone down an absolute storm. So this second topic that we want to talk about in the next 20 minutes is a really interesting one. And it's all about intimacy. So Shilpa, over to you. Why is the topic of intimacy so important within the narrative of menopause and midlife? So I think... Firstly, we all know that menopause has been so unspoken about till now. And throwing intimacy or intimate issues, it's still very what we call taboo, isn't it? Why is it so important? Because those symptoms are equally as important and people really suffer from symptoms. You wouldn't believe, I'm going to describe to you some of the things people say to me that I have to really tease out of them. But people don't want to volunteer these things because they're still taboo, or they feel embarrassed by them. But they are some of the symptoms that can really affect things such as a month, such as bad as they can't even leave the house. They won't go to the gym because they can't find clothing that that feels right and not uncomfortable. They're the people that know where every single toilet is in the shopping centre because they have to go a handful of 10, 20 times just for a shopping trip out for an hour. And then it affects things like their relationships as well. Really, you know, it doesn't just affect one person. It affects relationships and marriages and breakdown of those relationships, more importantly. Yeah. So, I mean, when we think about menopause, then we know um, there are anywhere between 50 to 70 symptoms. I mean, just because some may not be documented yet doesn't mean they don't exist. As we know, it's a very, very personal journey. But what we know is this would fall into not just a physical um, element or symptom but also a psychological symptom and I some would say so sociologically because you know menopause is a is a biopsychosocial experience so you know socially um, I was at my gym this morning and um, in fact that my my trainer said to me she said oh do come along to the uh, the legs bums and tums class Samantha and she said you'll love it because I'm going to be working with my local gym doing menopause work and they said actually how amazing you know but so many women come into those classes fearful about like, I don't think I'll be able to last the full half hour, 45 minutes without needing to go to a toilet. So I think even even though we may not be really aware, maybe actually when we just scratch beneath the surface a little bit, we'll see in people around us these modified behaviours that probably suggest this is a much bigger issue than hot flashes hot flashes it's just that we're we're fearful uh, which is one of the words I wrote down we're fearful to talk about it because where where does it go after that so so it is important and um you're right I mean the, the menopause narrative is very much a reductist one anyway which I'm not a big fan of you know it does all sort of focus on loss but with the right supports it can be so much about gaining things back can't it gaining all the things that you just talked about relationships that sex drive, that intimacy, better relationships, better friendships, all of those things. So let's talk a little bit, when you define intimacy, Shilpa, what is the definition of intimacy, either medically or from your own, from your own patient pool? What what, what are we talking about when we're talking about intimacy? It's so interesting, isn't it? Because I would say it means so different for different people. So for someone, intimacy may be a connection, between them and their partner. For someone else, it may be the physical ability to have sexual intercourse. For some people, it might be nothing to do with sexual intercourse, but might even be the pre, you know, before intercourse, the foreplay, the the, the connection that you make physically and mentally with somebody as well. It means so differently for so many different people. And it's really interesting you've said that because I think it's really important for us to know that as professionals because when we ask patients these questions we can be presumptive and I think one of the things that I really really focus on is making sure people have time to talk about their issues because what I might be thinking someone's worry about intimacy may be completely different to someone else's and when you just ask me as well about the um the different ways it can present One of the other ways it can present is people not coming for important screening tests like smear tests. So for me, again, 
I might presume they're not coming because they haven't got the time or they find it painful. But actually, unless I ask questions, is it because they've had a really traumatic experience before with either um, having had issues with the screening test itself or intimacy issues to them, you know, previous traumatic experiences, sexual experiences? Some women will say to me, I can't even have sex with my husband. How do you expect me to come and have a smear test with one of those plastic ratchety things? Mm. So it's really important gauging what is your experience of intimacy? What does that actually mean? You know, some people, we've got to know some people don't have, some people don't want to have sex. So to them, again, intimacy might just be that mental connection with somebody. Yeah, absolutely. I remember speaking to a sexologist, um, Dr. Angela Wright, and I know Dr. Angela Sharma, and they talked about, and I found found this really fascinating. They talked about, I mean, it's a bit like, if we think of intimacy is almost like the, the end destination. Actually, we've got to go through that whole journey of desire, pleasure, um you know because actually if we don't get into even that you know like if you're still waiting to be intimate but you're still running through what time is the dishwasher finishing and actually have I got the kids packed lunches ready oh and how oh did we lock the door you know all of those things it the intimacy destination isn't ever going to appear for people so again I think it's oversimplified isn't it really this this whole topic of intimacy um and I think again maybe we should be being taught this sort of stuff you know as part of our you know sexual education at school and things like that but I think I think what I'm hearing from you is um every person is different every person is unique every person will be coming with their own story and their own narratives around their approach their attitude and where they're at currently with pleasure desire and intimacy but actually there are some very um practical things that when the psychological aspects have been dealt with a little bit more can be helpful in midlife and menopause. Um, so let's talk a little bit then about the change of terminology and how we've sort of advanced in, in the last few years. Now, a term that we're becoming increasingly aware of is genitourinary syndrome of the menopause. So again, can you give people a brief sort of um, window into what is that about? And is that just another thing to have to consider or is it actually helpful to them? Yeah, so this is really helpful because like I just said, sometimes I have to tease information out of patients, but even as clinicians, even as patients, we hear that term, have you got vaginal dryness? And a lot of people have heard the term vaginal atrophy. So vaginal atrophy, that term came from the fact when you go through menopause, your estrogen levels decline, and then things down below start to get, the skin gets quite thin, um, things can tear more easily, um, and then the, the skin flora becomes, um, uh, the pH balance changes, you get more prone to infections, and then the vagina gets more dry. But actually, it's, you know, it's a whole host of issues. It's not just that, it's urine infections that constantly needing to go to the toilet. I've just described those, those ladies who will know where the toilet is because of bladder stimulation. They get that overactive bladder feeling. They're getting pain during sex. They're getting things like vulvodynia, um, which is, you know, painful, tender points. They're getting vaginismus, which is spasms in the va uh, vagina and around the perineum. Now, if we just call it vaginal atrophy, that's not encompassing, is it? All the urinary symptoms, all the se sexual questions we should be asking around the perineum. So between the bottom and, and the vagina, the vulva itself, you know, we, we call things the vagina. But actually, I wrote an article recently about it that, a patient kept saying to me, they've got a vaginal lump, they've got a vaginal lump. And I was like, well, let's bring you in to examine you. And actually, she had a cancerous lump in her vulva. She just, she didn't know what her anatomy was called. And she'd been having all these telephone conversations around about COVID. But because she hadn't known what that anatomical name was, somebody was just presuming, you know, she'd had some like vaginal cyst, or maybe she had a prolapse that was just sitting in her vagina. And no one thought, you know, should we examine her and actually find out where is this lump? So it's so important we change the terms and, and that we're using anatomical terms with patients and guiding patients as to, you know, know their anatomy. And it's funny, you mentioned about the school, I actually did a talk in school yesterday. And I spoke about it really openly about, you know, sexual, sexual intimate issues as well as getting them to know their anatomy. Exactly. It's so important. It's a bit like, I, I often think, you know, if you said, oh, could you go and get my bag from the car? 
you know, what would be really helpful in that moment is to know whereabouts in the car it is. And and the same is true of our anatomy. It's a very, very complex structure, uh, you know, female anatomy, those born, you know, with female hormones. You know, the reality is we do need to know the terminology. And, and actually, this is where there's a problem, because even in recording this video, you know, social media hasn't caught up with that. So we're not allowed to use the right terminology, which is disgraceful, really, because we're not educating people. You know, we, we're calling it all names like my Fufu, my Mini, my What's It, my, you know, because we're embarrassed. Uh, when in fact actually more offensive to be honest yeah and yeah exactly but it's all shrouded in, and veiled in in the fact that it's not acceptable to talk about it and 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 we must do whatever we can and it's wonderful that you're talking to the next generation and um I particularly like books like the one from Dr Nigat uh, Dr Nigat Arif you know which is the knowledge because it shows pictures you know if you look at in my, in my role as a performance coach we know that at least 50 percent of all learners are visual so we need to be looking, we need to be watching, getting to know what our normal yeah. is. And um, I always say to people, I don't have it on my desk, I normally do, which is so funny. Um, I've got a pocket mirror. I say, get yourself a pocket mirror, get, you some, get yourself something, get a little torch, get a little light, you know, get familiar with what your normal looks like so that actually you can, you know, if you're sensing there's something different, you'll be able to see if there's also something different too. Um, but that is rather unhelpful, isn't it? These phone, I know, I know it's just the way it is and I know we have to get through COVID somehow, but actually getting in front of a, a specialist, a doctor is so important, isn't it? Yeah, and it's, like you say, it was such a shame because I brought a whole kit of tools, didn't I, with an anatomy models. And it's, it's such a shame because I think visually, it would have been so powerful for us to be able to show that. And how can we sit here and say that we're trying to make it less taboo? And like you say, social media just hasn't caught up and we're not doing anything wrong. I'm a gynecologist. I had a post taken down from Facebook, but that's I'm a gynecologist. That's all I do is talk about. I know. And, I, and, and, I, and so if that's my job role, I don't I don't do any other part of the body. How, like, And yet it was taken down and, and that that's literally what I do as a job. So, yeah, I, find, I do find it incredible. You know, well, we're, we're, all, we're trying we're to say... Yeah, it's ridiculous, basically. It is ridiculous. And, you know, we could do so much more value here. So, you know, if anyone's watching who has any sort of capacity to change that sort of stuff, please do, because it's really unhelpful. So we know that the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, GSM as it's shortened to, is really a whole group of symptoms in, in its entirety. And in fact, I've got the brilliant booklet here from Diane Danzebrink, which is about understanding menopause. And um, this is downloadable. So I'll pop this in in the links. But not only has it got a symptom tracker, it's actually got a dedicated um, chapter from page 12 to page uh, 15. And what's brilliant is it's got a picture. So it's got a picture, but it's also got its own unique symptom tracker. So yeah, you can brilliant. actually take a look at that. So that's one way we can cover it off, Shilpa. We'll make sure that people have access to that. And that is downloadable. Um, so you can start start looking at that. So let's talk about then. So we understand it's a complex area. We understand it's quite dynamic as well, you know, because we're under the influence of our hormones and any topical hormones we might be taking. Um Talk to us a little bit then about what the treatments are for vaginal dryness, vulval dryness, if we've got any pain um, and any sort of sort of principles or strategies we can use using those products. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, again, one's individual. But I always say to, don't underestimate the use of even simple things. So I will start to talk to people. And we're talking right from taking history about lifestyle because lifestyle changes can make a big difference. Why can they make a big difference? because what we eat and drink can influence our vaginal pH. Why is that so important? Our vaginal pH, as soon as it changes and moves away, it can increase risk of infections like thrush, urine infections, things like bacterial vaginosis. And you wouldn't believe how heavily that can be influenced by um, what we eat and drink. And that's why you might have heard a lot of things like probiotics. There's some really good probiotics to try and keep our vaginal pH um, in, in neutral. And the same with the type of food and drink. So start with taking a good history and like just lifestyle. Do you smoke? Things like smoking can change the pH of what we eat and drink. And then what even simple things are you using in terms of washing? So a lot of people still don't realise just simple water to be used down below. You know, because not douching, what we call douching, which is putting like a shower head or extreme washing up into the vagina, because that itself can dry the vagina out 
change the pH and then increase things like bacterial vaginosis, one of the infections of the vagina. So making sure, you know, what kind of products are using perfumed products, because that can be an irritant as well. What kind of underwear are you wearing can influence it. So all these things, even just your lifestyle and, and the way you live day to day can make a huge difference. So don't underestimate just even making that more comfortable for people. You know, I've just said about um, gym equipment. A lot of women will say to me, I won't go to the gym because that light crop is so painful when you've got severe vagina or vulval dryness and your vulva are stuck together. Can you imagine then wearing really tight lycra and then sweating in that? So these things can make a huge difference. Then what else can we do to treatment? Let's again, keep simple. So things like moisturizer, we mentioned it in our last um, uh, podcast we did. And I said, you know, I said to you, wasn't it? It was very cheesy of me to say, but we wouldn't let our our faces get all cracked and dry and bleed. And so the same with vaginal moisturizers, they're absolutely amazing. And people get mixed up between moisturizers and lubricant. So moisturizers hold in moisture and the whole job of it is to plump up the, uh, the vulva, the vaginal tissue and be permanent treatment. Lubricant is a quick fix during intercourse for during that, during that time, that, that um, during the actual um, uh, doing, uh, having sex, sorry. Whereas a moisturizer is to apply, you know, I say to women start daily and then you might not need it daily. You might just need it a couple of times a week, but choose a good product, do your research. You know, again, we said we weren't going to show any products, but there are a couple that I would really recommend because make sure that they, they don't contain loads of additive, loads of glycerin, loads of perfume, because that changes the pH of your of your vagina. And you want to keep it Let's neutral, show those based. ones. Let's show those ones, because I know that we have actually showed those before. Yes, so it's the Yes so, brand. Y- yes. So Yes is the brand that I always recommend to people because it's very neutral pH, it's water-based, so it doesn't change the pH of your vagina. And so it doesn't have lots yeah, of additives. Can you put it up to the camera? Because we've got a little bit of glare on it. So it's Y E S V M, is it? Yeah, yeah, vaginal moisturizer. Yes. Okay. Vaginal moisturizer. Great. That's fantastic. So, and, and they're a great brand anyway, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about like uh, hopefully if we if we get to talk about a little bit about the uh, intimate side of it, I'm just going to talk about something there. And then vaginal estrogen. So, you know, there's also this misconception that you just use vaginal estrogen as a quick fix when in fact I say to women use it lifelong because a lot of women your symptoms will return and it's not about just fixing the problem then it's about preventing it from getting worse and the more estrogen we lose then in the vagina the pH changes the more collagen we lose the skin becomes thinner the barrier breaks down more risk of infection so what you're trying to do is prevent that from happening And you've got other symptoms as well. You've got things like vaginal prolapse where people get that dragging sensation. So actually vaginal estrogen in the form of pessaries, in the form of cream, that can also help with those symptoms. Now, there's lots of different types of vaginal estrogen. And this is, again, individualizing. There are some which have a reusable applicator. Lots of patients are very green friendly now. So rather than using a plastic, there's ones like that. There's also ones that your doctor can place in. So you can imagine patients who have lots of really bad arthritis. Mm. Can you imagine trying to put a very fiddly um, applicator in? Whereas you can get these pessaries that stay in for three months that your doctor can put in for you. What are they called, Shilpa? They're called E-string. Yes. So I've seen 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 Jacqueline Bowden doing things with one and Dr. Sarah Ball. So, and I've seen one myself. I mean, I'm still like amazed, like how would you navigate that but it looks very flexible very pliable and you literally put it and it's quite easy to take out as well you literally grab your finger around it don't you and actually for some women in my gynecology clinic if they've got a little bit of a mild prolapse it does actually help just lift that up a a, a little bit as well so sometimes they use it for scaffolding (laughs) yeah (laughs) excellent on my website it's all free I've actually made a table of all the different types of vaginal estrogens and I show that to my patient so that they can have a look and see what might suit them better. Great, that's really helpful. And one thing I would just like to tip into the conversation is, um, again, as we go through our life course, I mean, one thing that I had, which was I thought I was getting bouts of recurrent thrush infections, but in fact, it was actually lactobacillus overgrowth, which is called cytolytic vaginosis. So that can give very, very similar symptoms to thrush. So what I would say to people is, 
not to be your own doctor obviously it's important to know your own body but actually with anything if it's not responding to treatment it's really important because I know people can and I was this person constantly getting over the counter stuff which just makes it worse because that kills any yeast that might keep it in balance and now we've got this overgrowth so I would just say to people as just as a, as, as a patient myself um try not to be your own doctor uh try and be your own best friend but when it feels and looks like it's not resolving please go and get it checked out because all they can do is take a swab they can have a look under a microscope mic microscopy see what's actually going on and that was what happened for me so it is really important isn't it Shilpa so I did a video on this recently when it was gynecological cancer week people with things like persistent uh, discharge persistent dryness or itching they go and get treatments presuming to be thrush so even you know today's clinic someone said oh, I've had lots of recurrent thrush and I said Can I, hold on a minute has this been diagnosed with a swab no no I've just gone to get treatment over the counter so it's not you know we we're presuming having these consultations that they've been diagnosed whereas actually what can happen is you're going for vaginal dryness continuously getting over the counter treatment but has anyone examined you and check whether that patch of dryness is actually something that needs investigating or biopsying exactly. you know this is really really important so anyone with vaginal dryness I am very you know especially now we're through COVID we've had lots of telephone consultations yes. if they've already tried once thrush treatment or they want to try thrush treatment in the interim I will still book them a face-to-face -face examination with me because I want I, I need to make sure they're very aware that don't just keep presuming you need some thrush treatment you need some steroid treatment and treat it yourself because it could be something else that needs investigating yeah so it's really really important you, you get that for help definitely definitely and I I was so glad that I I did that myself so so um obviously there are actually mechanical ways that we can actually because when we talk about we can talk about the tissues and things what can happen you know through the structural changes through that declining collagen and elastin you know the the muscular structure of our vagina and our vulva can change and so obviously may, making things like penetration that can be more uncomfortable so what can people do Shilpa is there anything people can do or is that it do we just like go that's it I'm done type thing or is there more that can be offered for somebody no, absolutely and I use this quite broadly with all my patients who suffer from vaginal symptoms and you know we said earlier about psychological don't forget it becomes a vicious cycle so people who've had really awful physical trauma in the past can end up with psychosexual issues as well vice versa you can end up I've, I mentioned the words things like vaginismus and that becomes an involuntary tightening of your vaginal muscles so imagine if you've had a really painful experience be it something like um um trauma or a sexual rape or something or even something like a smear test that's been very painful you then have that memory so next time you go to have sex next time you go to have that procedure your vagina automatically clenches up and and you get involuntary muscles so what can we do to try and relax that the first thing is you mentioned this amanda the more you think about well, I'll make it a regimented experience, you know, it's not going to happen because you need, often people do need that connection, that emotional connection. So I will often say to people, if you're doing it, you know, it's not easy when you've got small kids, they're getting up in the middle of the night, trying to say, let's just have a quick, you know, session for five minutes before the baby wakes up, isn't going to work. And so try and romanticize it. Um, and I don't mean that patronizingly, but the more we make it regimented and it becomes a chore, it can be really, really difficult for this to work. So the more people can relax and think, do you know what? I'm going to I'm going to actually, you know, have a glass of wine, have a romantic meal, make it. And I will often say to people, don't make the first time a, a penetrative experience if you don't want it to. Just start off with doing things like foreplay experience with your partner. Um, you know, it, it, so, and that can also help with your day to day vaginal symptoms. So the more lubrication you have. You mentioned what physical things that people can do. I explained to you earlier, actually, we now know there's lots of good papers and evidence for use of bullet, vib bullet vibrators. So this is not only for pleasurable experience, so to use to try and get people to find sex more comfortable. We know around menopause, all the changes that are happening to the skin. What does that vibration do? It actually increases circulation. What does circulation do? It increases the skin and thickness and pump, plumps up the skin. And so you get less of that thinness and the pain. And we know that there's more and more papers coming up with that evidence saying that actually it's regenerating the cells in the skin down below.
which is why there's so many studies done on things like laser treatment and things like that. So trying to relax, easier said than done, I appreciate. Then simple things like trying to just include your partner into that. You might want to use a bullet vibrator and dilators. They're what we traditionally use. So for those of you who don't know, dilators are, they mimic almost their, their, like a phallic shape and they come in incremental sizes. So you start with the smallest one. And then, for example, you would for two hours a day, put that in. And slowly over time, you increase the diameter of the, of the dilator you're using. And as I said, it's not just for menopause. Imagine when you've had a vaginal delivery, you get sewn up again. Some people find it really tricky and they get really tight. So it's just a gentle way of just opening and relaxing and eventually over time stretching that tissue. And again, that's what a vibrator um, can do as well. It's not only increase the circulation, but if you use it for penetration, it can hopefully, um, it, the penetration increase the, um, the um, plumpness and the circulation around the tissue. But again, help with that, that um, ability to have that penetration as well. Yeah, and then absolutely. we said, don't forget about moisturizers. What about um, what about uh, lubricants? But again, using a good company like Yes. Can I talk about the double glide method? If you're quick, because we've got to get one more question in. Yeah, okay. so the glide method is where this is where you would have an oil based lubricant and a water based lubricant. And on you or your partner, you'd put the water based. So you might want to put the oil based inside the vagina. And actually, the oil based is really good to help moisturizer as well. And then during um, sex, you would then put the water based on your partner. And it's what we call a double glide because it makes it very slippery. And so you're not getting any dryness or any resistance. And it really can help. So you know, for the, I'll put it on my uh, website as well, but look it up at the double glide method. It's and, a how really does that useful work way. Using, and how does that work if you're using condoms? So one thing I would say is for condoms, oil-based lubricants, be very careful because they don't work, okay? They they um, reduce they the efficiency. They erode the latex, of, don't they? They erode the latex, so be careful. Um, but, I mean, you could use water and water if you were yes. going to do that yes. um, in that double bay, but be very careful with oil-based. Yes, um, and yeah. I, only, I only say that because I I know, I know that from, pre, from previously. And, um, yeah, so that's really helpful too. And one of the things I was also say is... Uh, intimacy and sexual pleasure doesn't have to be with another person it's absolutely yeah. brilliant to do it on your own um yes. to and it, and actually in terms of desire and pleasure you're going to learn more about yourself in order to find out what you like and what you don't like um and these are the bits of knowledge i've picked up from all the experts that i've spoken to since doing this series and that solo solo penetration is absolutely fine or just stimulation so it doesn't have to involve another person but anyway coming on to our no. last question um so testosterone when te when should testosterone be used because we hear a lot a lot a lot about libido testosterone testosterone libido what's the answer with that right so the short answer in terms of what the guidelines say is that on those on established hrt testosterone should be used for hypersexual desire disorder. So what that means is lack of desire, lack of arousal, lack of orgasm for those things. Why do they suggest using HRT first? Because for many women, the use of estrogen HRT can improve libido. That's one reason. The other reason is testosterone is actually converted to estrogen. So if you've still got estrogen symptoms that haven't been resolved, the simple way of describing it is they just compete for receptors. So you want to solve all, try and um, try and resolve all your estrogen symptoms and then bring in testosterone so it's got nothing to compete with. That's a bit more complex than that, but that's really the simple way of how I explain to patients why it's important we use HRT. Then the other thing I would say, because this is, you know, said in a very quick way, but it's, you know, low libido is very complex. And if you're not sleeping, if you're absolutely exhausted, you've got relationship issues, no amount of testosterone is going to resolve that. And again, that comes down to us having that conversation, having that really nice you know, space for you to discuss what is actually going on in your life, because it would take me a lot quicker just to give you a prescription of testosterone than to find out actually what's going on in your life. And is this actually going to work? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's why for people listening, I know it can seem frustrating sometimes. In fact, someone just messaged me before I came on the call with you going, well, you know, I wish I had my old period back. You know, it's, it's been great, but, you know, I've got four weeks in and, and I'm just wondering if I need to change things. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's just, you know, this is why we need to wait, because we need to give time for whatever dose we're starting on, building up, saturating those uh, 
um, receptors without oversaturating them, but seeing what the symptomatic relief is. That's why we don't do blood tests, really. We're looking at the symptoms and looking for improvements in the symptoms. So this is why three to six months minimum, really, to sort of see what we're able to achieve with that. And, and as Shilpa is saying, you need to be adequately estrogenized. Otherwise, you're just wasting the testosterone, quite honestly. It's yeah. just it's just converting to estrogen but what i would also say as well is this is where the the powerful part of stress comes in in our one-to-one sessions when we talk to people you know if you've got stress concurrently um alongside menopause which most people do have you know you're you're being robbed of your own hormones anyway because any cholesterol that would have made sex hormones is being prioritized to make cortisol which is your stress hormone so actually there's a nice byproduct to all of this the more we can relax the more engaged we are with our intimate health our intimate pleasure our intimate desire then actually we're probably more likely to access our own hormones because our stress levels drop down access to our own hormones increases and as Shilpa says you know if you are taking HRT then actually and still experiencing issues, you could really benefit from testosterone. But what I would also like to say is it's not for everybody. I I, no. I I was on, you know, it's better for me. And I definitely benefit from testosterone and things have improved. But I just want to warn people that it's not like some panacea moment, you know, where it's like all suddenly sorted out. I think people should go into this knowing that it's just another tool in a very large toolkit. Okay, so a cu- couple of things on that. The type of HRT, it's really important we make sure oral HRT can actually worsen libido. So the first thing I ask patients is what type of HRT are you on? Yeah. The reason being is oral HRT binds to something called sex hormone binding globulin, and that mops your testosterone out of your circulation. So if you're on oral HRT, there's no real point adding in testosterone. The first thing you need to do is go on to something like a spray, a patch or a gel, because that may in itself yeah. improve your testosterone. The other reasons we don't use blood tests anymore is it's really important to individualize. Some people will have very low testosterone levels, but have an absolutely fine um, sexual desire. Some people have a um, normal testosterone, but actually their low desire is there. And that's where it's important to uh, ask those questions. And you made a really good point, actually, when I, when I say to patients about um, uh, start on your own, if you don't even want to involve a partner, but you don't have to be in a relationship to have low sexual desire a lot of women feel really embarrassed to say to me but I want to be able to masturbate but I didn't think I could come to you because I don't have a partner and therefore that's not a reason for me to ask for help but absolutely not and you know you've got to feel comfortable to talk to your clinician because it's really important that whatever stage whoever you're with if you're not with anybody you should feel comfortable to be able to say you know sex is important to me with whether it's by myself whether it's somebody else you know whatever the circumstance brilliant that's a fantastic place to leave that on so Shilpa is there anything that I haven't asked you that you could squeeze into 30 seconds that you think might be useful just to bring this all together I think we've got, I think we've we've probably covered it I mean there's so much I could say about this but what I would say is it's it's very individualized please don't feel embarrassed or seek help when when somebody you know sex and intimate issues and low libido and having vaginal pain for things like screening is so important. If it's important to you, it's important. And it doesn't matter whether it's for your screening or whether it's for sexual desire. There are lots of things we can do. And I know we've done it really quickly and touched on all of those things, but there are so many things. And don't forget, it can take time. It's not necessarily a one appointment quick fix. I still work with ladies over weeks talking about how we can then introduce dilators, what stage we go on to the next stage, when we can introduce um, vibrators, how we can then introduce partners and bring partners to your appointments. Don't forget, you know, communication can be so important. And I find the best way is actually, you soon get over that embarrassment when you have a three-way conversation, um, you know, with the partner there because they feel included and you feel that connection as well. So if you can bring partners and, and bring everybody into the conversation, then it can it can really help. Definitely. So um, and what I would say, lastly, just to uh, add, please go back and watch the episode that Shilpa and I did uh, quite a few months ago, which was we covered so much of this in so much more detail. So I think we've done ourselves justice there, um, Shilpa, because there is another episode and I'll make reference to that in the yeah. show notes. So for now, Shilpa, thank you very much. I mean, that's great, isn't it? We've, we've understood everything about uh, what to discuss, 
terminology, um, the importance of feeling that you can be open. And so hopefully clinicians watching this as well will take some take home messages around actually how do we make people feel more comfortable as well. Obviously, Shilpa is incredibly trained at this because of her, both of her roles and actually being able to, to feel that you can talk about anything um, in those appointments. So for now, Shilpa, thank you so much for your time. See you. Take care.